We live in a world in which people seem to be screaming at each other. Climate change is real. Climate change is not real. Vaccines work. They're safe. They're not safe. What's interesting about all the screaming is that everybody seems to really believe that science is on their side, that the other side of the argument has somehow been duped. So where does that leave us? How do those of us that are involved with science communication make a difference? How do we add value? Stick with me. I've got a framework that you might find useful. Let's think about the voices in any of these conversations as existing on a matrix that represents their relative level of education, training, experience, expertise, let's call that qualifications in an area against their relative level of objectivity on that subject. And we can imagine four quadrants. And we're gonna go through each of these quadrants and I'm gonna focus on the one on the top left. Now the top left quadrant, this is the quadrant in which I find myself on most subjects and believe it or not, Acknowledging that fact represents a really powerful communications opportunity, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Now, who sits in these quadrants? Let's start at the bottom on the left. Here we've got the ideologues. These are people who take a position on a subject because of some pre-existing ideology. It could be their religion. It could be their political affiliation. Look, we're all very tribal, and we're all predisposed to adopting beliefs that are held by a group of people from whom we'd like acceptance. So no judgment here. On some issue or another, we all probably fall into this quadrant. Two things about this quadrant. Firstly, you're not going to change people's minds. So don't get emotionally involved with some debate that you can't win. People in this quadrant never know that they're in this quadrant. And when we are in this quadrant, we're subject to a few things. Firstly, motivated reasoning. We start with an idea and then we look for a narrative that supports it. And part of that includes something called confirmation bias. We pay much, much more attention to information that supports the belief or idea that we want and less to information that doesn't. We all do this from time to time. We also see what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And basically this means that the less competent a person is in an area, the more likely they are to overestimate their own competency in that area. Politicians do this all the time. Now let's look at the next quadrant. Here we've got a category of people or groups or, or, or institutions who, despite having a high level of expertise, are still nevertheless not objective. So a good example of this is industry or industry-funded research or ideologically-funded research, where financial or ideological incentives come into play. You might find that only those studies that support a particular position get submitted for publication, or that the science itself is subject to something we call p-hacking. Now, p-hacking is a process whereby researchers deliberately or sometimes even unconsciously make a small number of decisions, but in sequence, along the research process path, that biases the results in a particular direction. Now, research coming from industry, for example, can be considered more reliable if the study hypothesis and the methods are pre-registered publicly ahead of time and the company is committed to publishing the results no matter what the outcome. So let's talk about the top right-hand quadrant. Here we've got people or institutions or voices, right, that have got high levels of expertise and knowledge and experience. They also are objective, and that's extremely important here, and I'm going to talk to you about that right now. A good example of this is publicly funded research at a university. Scientists aren't incentivized or motivated to have results that go one way or the next. Of course, there are exceptions we have to be aware. But for the most part, these are people or institutions or studies that are fully engaged with what we call the scientific method. And at the end of what can only be described as a painstaking process, and I'm going to describe that to you in just a second, scientists come to what we call consensus. Now, notwithstanding when there's scientific consensus, there are occasional detractors. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's fine. It's healthy. But let's talk about this process. The starting point is in order to get your research funded, you need to have done the educational heavy lifting, right? So you've spent years studying day and night, making sure that you understand the nuances of the subject with excruciating detail. Then before you get your funding, you have to draft a research proposal. This is scrutinized by your colleagues and then by a funding agency board of experts. Now, the way in which scientific conclusions are drawn for the most part, and notwithstanding that there are different scientific methods, is the starting point is to assume that you're wrong, right? So they start with what's called the null hypothesis and then demonstrate that the data doesn't support the null hypothesis and that the alternative can in fact be accepted within certain statistical parameters. Now then, to publish these findings, you have to go through a process of peer review. And again, these are experts. They've got high levels of objectivity. They have to declare any interests up front if they're going to participate as a referee. And only once the papers pass through all of this does the paper get published. 
And even then, we're not jumping up and down about this evidence. We want to find that these results are replicable. In other words, that other scientists following the same methods draw the same conclusions. And when enough studies have been performed, we can undertake what's called meta-analysis. And this is the process whereby all of the studies can be pooled, all of the results can be pooled and combined to provide one overall study result. The point here is that the hurdles that these scientists need to overcome, or the hoops that they need to jump through, the skepticism and scrutiny from their peers, the rigorous standards that have to be met, and the level of transparency that has to be upheld in order to even get published in the first place is quite remarkable. And we still roll our eyes if a person points to just one study as justification for their position. We want to see meta-analysis. We want to see consensus. And when we see it, it's super exciting. Next, we've got people with low level of qualifications. And by low level of qualifications, I don't mean you know nothing. I mean, you're not an expert. You don't have a PhD on this. This isn't your day job, right? But you've nevertheless got high levels of objectivity. So you want to know the truth. And on most subjects, this is where I find myself. I'm a public health doctor, so I'm not an expert on climate change. On the issue of climate change, I land up in the top left-hand quadrant. Not just climate change, but just about everything that isn't part of my day job. And by the way, when it comes to science communication, this is the group of people that you want to talk to. The bottom two quadrants, you're wasting your time. The top right quadrant, well, you don't need to. But it's within this quadrant that you're going to find people that are genuinely looking for the truth. And they might find access to information and answers and science genuinely useful. This is where the opportunity is, especially amongst educated people who want to be advocates of science and consider themselves to be skeptics. Now, the science communication opportunity is this. If you self-identify as being in this quadrant, I don't know it all, I'm not an expert, right? You can come alongside somebody and with the perspective of, let's agree that neither of us is an expert and let's agree that we both want to get information from highly qualified and objective voices. So in this context, Science communication isn't about trying to win an argument with somebody who really isn't going to be convinced one way or the next, no matter what. It's about shining a light on our colleagues who are the true experts in that particular field. It's about lifting up a process that is reliable and honest and highlighting the fact that we trust that process and that we believe that even though we know it's not perfect and mistakes get made and scientists are fallible, that the scientific method is a beautiful thing and we can have an extremely high degree of confidence and trust in the results that come from it. Now, you heard me talking about meta-analysis. That's really the gold standard. It's the best we've got. And the way you do it is you do a systematic literature review. You extract the data from all the studies. You pull them, and you have this combined result. There is a platform called Nested Knowledge that really facilitates this entire process from end to end. Nested Knowledge sponsor my channel. So the Nested Knowledge, I love them. That's a fantastic product. And I'd like to encourage you, click on the link in the description below this video and check them out. Now, the next video that I want you to watch is a video about climate change and health. Given that you watched this video, I think you'll have an interest in that video too. Okay, have a great day. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. Speak to you soon. Take care.